Five years ago, this was the Big Muddy Ranch. A few miles away was the small rural community of Antelope. Today, the Central Oregon landscape remains unchanged, but this is no longer the Big Muddy Ranch. Now it's known as Rancho Rajneesh. The small town of Antelope, after a lengthy legal battle, has been renamed Rajneesh Prom. Tonight we have the rare opportunity of taking a look at the man behind these changes, the Bhagwan Sri Rajneesh. But before we meet with the Bhagwan, these are some highlights of the ranch. The first thing that was very apparent to us was the tight security into the ranch. The county road leading to Rancho Rajneesh has three well-armed checkpoints, not to mention surveillance helicopters that periodically sweep the perimeter. The ranch itself covers 6,000 square acres in the heart of Oregon. Much of this land is dry and arid, and mainly fit for grazing cattle. When we drove into the valley the Rajneeshis call home, it's such a sharp contrast to the sagebrush you drive by for miles that it looks like Shangri-La. Through several water and land reclamation projects, a large portion of the valley contains lush green grass, trees, and shrubs. Despite this paradisical look, all visitors must check in with the Chamber of Commerce, and all cars are searched for drugs and firearms. One thing that surprised us was the amount of capitalism going on at the ranch. A full-scale mall, several restaurants and bars provide the Rajneeshis with all the comforts of home. The improvements on the land are impressive for the four short years they have been here. Few sannyasins own their own cars. Most choose to use the Rajneesh bus transportation system. Currently, 109 buses are in use. 90% of the food consumed at the ranch is grown there. Several acres are constantly under till, and a large greenhouse keeps them in produce during the hard Central Oregon winters. A large dairy herd supplies the ranch with milk, butter, and cheese. Perhaps the most striking landmark at the ranch is the Rajneesh Church called Murdad. This covers two and a half square acres. The Rajneeshis worship for two hours every day. Their worship consists of discourses from Bhagwan, dancing, singing, and controversial screaming sessions. Two helicopters hover over his Rolls Royce during his driving sessions. The Rajneesh Peace Force, their version of a police department, is highly visible and sometimes intimidating. Uzi submachine guns are stock issue for some officers, but most carry standard police issue weapons. Devoted followers of the Bhagwan Sri Rajneesh lined up hours in advance just to catch a glimpse of him, and a hand-picked group of 50 sannyasins were fortunate enough to hear him in person. We found Bhagwan to be a guru with a sense of humor. You look very nice in blue. Hi. Is, is that one of your favorite colors? All colors are my favorite, except red. <laughs> Do you see a lot of red around here? Your type. <laughs> Why do these people like you so much? Why are you so appealing? I'm also wondering. <laughs> is it, is it uh, the beard or the money or the, the prestige or... I don't have any money. Mm -hmm. I don't have any prestige. I am notorious all over the world. What prestige I can have. To be with me needs courage to be with a notorious man. You will lose your prestige if you are with me. Why is that? Because I'm notorious. <laughs> you need not do anything, you just be with me. <laughs> you will lose your prestige, your respectability, your service. Everything will be gone. <laughs> they love me because I love them. 
and they cannot love me more than I do love them. Even the love of all my sannyasins around the world is put on a scale on one side and my love for them on the other side. I am going to be weightier. When, uh, when or if uh, you, you do pass away or, or if, if you died, something happened, who would take over? Would there be someone to take over? What would happen to Rajneesh Param if something happened? Let me start from some point. I have been waiting my whole life that somebody will ask it, but nobody has asked it. Nobody asks me what will happen to me when I die. Nobody is worried about that. <laughs> what kind of I, pilgrimage would you be going on when, when you die? Whatever kind of pilgrimage, but when one is dying, at least he is out of this world, out of this life, out of all that is known. He is moving into the dark and the unknown and the unfathomable. If you really love the person you will be concerned about him. But the trouble is everybody is concerned about himself, although you will be living and I will be dying. What, what could we do then? What could we do to help At us live? At least living? you could ask the question. <laughs> <laughs> but for my whole life I have been waiting, nobody has asked it. And I was just wondering, what, what is your concept of God? I know you've been asked that so many times, but... My concept is exactly whole because I can reach nowhere. I don't have to cut the words in two. <laughs> God is nowhere. God is nowhere. I was wondering that because... No, I... wait, don't wonder. <laughs> Let me finish. Moses tortured Jews for forty years. Almost seventy-five percent of his followers died in that stupid search for a holy land. And finally, not because that they have found the holy land, But just to keep up the face, he declared Israel to be the holy land. Now there is nothing holy in Israel. And he has given commandments to them to be followed after he is gone. The same has been done by Muhammad, by Buddha. They are too much concerned about the fact when they are gone, what their people are going to do. It is something of tremendous importance why they are so much concerned. The reason is because in their presence they have persuaded their disciples to repress every natural instinct. Sex has to be repressed and they have to be celibate. Under their influence and charismatic personality people have a 
accepted something absolutely unnatural. Only an impotent man can be celibate. And no impotent man has been known to become enlightened, not yet. He has no energy in him. Enlightened will Enlightenment will need tremendous explosion of energy. He cannot even create a child. How can he create himself in a totally luminous way? So no important man has ever become enlightened. All the people who have become enlightened were really over-sexual. In fact, their over-sexuality was one of the causes for their enlightenment. They had so much energy that the woman was not enough. Many women were also not enough. They had such a great energy that they wanted to make love to the whole existence itself. And that's what enlightenment is. It is an orgasmic experience with existence itself. Are you enlightened yourself? Yes. How enlightened? Are you very enlightened? <laughs> there are no quantities in enlightenment. You made a comment a few years back that uh, I, I believe it was two-thirds of the world population would die of AIDS. Now recently all the things that we've seen in the news that the figures are just astronomical, do you feel that your prediction is starting to come true? No need because they are going to die. So There is no way to save them. How soon do you think? Within these 20 years, the last, before the 21st century, they are going to die, either by nuclear weapons or by AIDS. The nuclear weapons are created by our whole past politics that has brought to the culmination of nuclear weapons. And the AIDS is the culmination of our whole religious past. AIDS is the logical conclusion of all sexual perversions. And religions have caused in men all kinds of perversions. Homosexuality is a very religious discipline. Because monks were forced to live together in monasteries where no woman was allowed to enter. There is a Catholic monastery in Ithos, 1,000 years old. In these 1,000 years, not even a six-month-old baby girl has entered the monastery. Even that is not allowed. I sometimes wonder, six-month-old baby girl, what is the fear and what kind of monks are living inside? Are the monks are monsters? And in Ethos the rule is once you enter the monastery only your dead body comes out. You will never come out alive to have any contact with other human beings. 
There are nunneries where only women can live, no men can enter in. Now what do you want? You are creating the situation for homosexuality, lesbianism, masturbation and all kinds of things. These monks, these nuns are the original source of AIDS. So your politics has brought you to the Third World War which is looming on the horizon and your religions have brought you to AIDS. Your political and religious leaders have done great service to humanity and to this planet. I am certainly concerned with my people. They have been given all the information about AIDS. While governments are trying to repress it, for the simple reason because if you accept that AIDS is, is spreading, it may create anarchy, chaos, turmoil. Governments are repressing exact information, rich people can afford private doctors, private physicians and they can keep their mouths shut with their dollars. So you don't think the federal government is doing enough to control AIDS then? Not at all. They are doing nothing. Their senators have AIDS. And they are not yet imprisoned, those senators. Their senators are homosexuals. They should be Im immediately arrested. There is no other way put them into imprisonment. Would you do that with a sannyasin? My sannyasins are living in a totally different world. I have one million sannyasins around the world and I am trying them all to come and live in communes. Don't live in the outside world. So I am segregating them into different places, into different countries in communes. And because we do not condemn anything, every sannyasin goes through the medical test and if he finds that he has AIDS, the whole commune is full of compassion for the person. Are you testing for AIDS then? Do yes. you test for AIDS? Yes. New converts? Yes. Our, we have our own medical center, all kinds of expertise, doctors, nurses, hospital. And we have a special place far away in the mountains where we remove those people who have AIDS. We take care of them, we give them everything they need, books to read, films to see, games to play, and they are respected in the commune and everybody is responsible and they are responsible that there are no more to make any sexual contact, not even kissing, because AIDS is 
cut through kissing. So I am telling my sannyasins, change your patterns, drop the idea of kissing, which is certainly unhygienic even without AIDS. Two persons mixing their saliva, which contains all kinds of germs, and there are idiots who are doing French kissing. <laughs> I have supposed to my sannyasins change that pattern, start rubbing noses with each other, <laughs> hygienic, clean, and if sometimes somebody has cold, at the most you can catch cold. And this is not a big problem. Adrian Greek is East Multnomah County's leading expert on cults and cult-like activity. He's recently published a book, Mind Abuse by Cults and Others. Today we're speaking to Mr. Greek about the subject of the Rajneeshis. Perhaps you could start by explaining the appeal that uh, the Bhagwan does have for people. Well, the Bhagwan or Rajneesh has an appeal for people that are feeling a sense of powerlessness or joylessness in their lives. They feel overwhelmed by uh, fut uh, future dangers of the world, the loss of uh, guidelines and in our society in terms of values and in terms of goals uh, that they feel that maybe they've, they've gone so far in their lives that they're overwhelmed by responsibility and have a sense that uh, there's nothing more to live for. And so uh, they uh, hear or read of his writings and, uh, and his permission to uh, throw over all the responsibility and just enjoy themselves and be themselves and they're sort of hooked into a system. Now, in, in 1983, he made a series of predictions of things. This was right before he took his, his vow of silence. Um, one of the things that he has said in the last few years is AIDS. Mm -hmm. the, the, I, I believe it was two-thirds of the world's population would die of AIDS. Now, today we see a large epidemic of AIDS that, that seems to be growing and mushrooming out of shape. Do you feel that uh, this is going to affect getting converts, more people are going to believe that, that he does have some, some ability for? I think one of the things that you run into is contradictions uh, between the extreme uh, removal of limits and responsibility and uh, some very strong counter moves of saying that there are really bad things over here and things are going to happen to you if you do this, this, and this. And so it's a real restrictive type of thing at the same time. I, I personally believe his uh, projection of the two-thirds of the world po world's population dying of AIDS probably really was taking into consideration the lifestyle of the Rajneeshis, where there are multiple uh, sexual relationships uh, on a continuous kind of basis, which seems to be the uh, primary uh, audience uh, or people that get caught into, uh, into the AIDS syndrome. It's a, uh, and so he was, he was bringing that out, but it also produces the contradiction, the one of the free sex versus the restricted sex, and no responsibility versus having responsibility for protecting your partner or protecting yourself. Do you think that he's using the press? Oh, I think he's a master at uh, using the media and, and using all kinds of, of methods of communicating uh, uh, and getting the allegiance of his followers and projecting that into a black-white situation, one in which those people that are followers of his, believers in Bhagwan, are the, are, are the true people, are the only one, it's the only way, and that the outsiders, anyone who would be critical, is a bigot, a prejudiced, is against them. And creating that kind of a wall produces an isolation within the organization, which isolates them from the realities of of all the gray areas of life, which uh, is most of what exists out here, is the, um, is the fact that there isn't just right or wrong. There are a lot of different options available. My whole teaching is centered on the present moment, this moment. 
I do not care for any tomorrows. In the first place, the tomorrow never comes. Whatever comes is always the now. You are never there, you are always here. Existence knows only two words, now and here. I am not giving them any discipline, any rules of conduct. I am simply teaching them to be aware, alert, be independent, take your responsibility and do whatsoever you want to do. This has been a local production of Rogers Cable Systems of Multnomah East, winner of the 1985 Hometown USA Award for overall excellence in local programming.